the webinar, Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Subrogation. This is, as those of you who do state work comp know, uh, a second cousin to state workers' compensation uh, with a few more twists, uh, many more opportunities for full recoveries, but also several significant obstacles, traps, pitfalls that you have to avoid. Um, in particular, uh, Jim Busenlener, who's with us, is in our New Orleans office. He'll be going into some of those traps and pitfalls with regard to waivers of subrogation. Um, as we get going, I wanted to remind you that um, you do the number of people in the webinar. I said we're going to be answering the questions at the end. We have a trivia question that we're going to be doing during the webinar. Um, I will read the trivia question twice at some point during the webinar. And once I give you the question, provide your answer through the question pane on the dashboard we just looked at. And the first one to answer correctly uh, gets an all expense paid, tri paid trip to where, Jimmy? Oh, it's a book. We, <laughs> you get the book of your choice from our website. It could be workers' compensation, auto, ERISA, health. Um, uh, there's a covered book. Uh, depending on what you want, uh, we'll, get, we'll get you a book. And we will reveal the winner toward the end of the webinar. Uh, so uh, Jamie will email the winner via email. And we'll also announce the winner as well as the answer to the trivia question uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, those of you who are involved in and interested in Texas CE credit, uh, the Texas Department of Insurance has gotten a little more strict on this. And to satisfy their requirements for Texas CE, they now require us, this is relatively new, to be able to prove if they should request it that you were in attendance and paying attention throughout the whole webinar. Now, I can't imagine that you wouldn't pay attention for the whole webinar because of the presenters. But for those of you who want the Texas CE credit sometime randomly during, randomly during the webinar, Jamie, who is in the background monitoring the webinar, will send you a chat message through the dashboard's chat pane asking you if you want the Texas CE credit. You just simply type yes and hit enter. The chat message won't expire. When you see it, answer it. If you don't need the CE, then just ignore it. So. With that, with that behind us, let's talk about Longshore. Um, one of the reasons that <clears throat> we have an office in New Orleans, and by the way, Jim and I practice law together in Houston at a firm in, uh, in downtown Houston, Hughes, Waters, and Askinase for many years, and we handled Jones Act and Maritime and Longshore out of Houston, and we still do a lot of work out of Houston, both of us being licensed in Texas, but the reason we have... Um, and uh, offices in New Orleans and in Los Angeles, think about what those two have in common. They're two of America's biggest ports. So we do a good deal of Longshore um, Defense Base Act, uh, Longshore um, War Hazard Act, but the, a lot of the Longshore that we do is out of those three ports in California, in Texas, and in Louisiana. There's some on the, on the Great Lakes up here in Wisconsin, but uh, primarily it's out of the, uh, the ocean-going ports. So, uh, Longshore, <clears throat> the federal government um, long ago was actually the first uh, in America to establish a workers' compensation program. We know that Longshore is very, very similar to state work comp with some significant differences, but uh, the federal government back in 1908 uh, beat even Wisconsin, who was the first state to have a state workers' compensation program in 1911. And by 1921, all but six states in the District of Columbia had workers' compensation laws, but there was a gap. And there's this interface between <clears throat> maritime and state workers' compensation. And um, the Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act provided workers' compensation for injured employees engaged in stevedoring, uh, <clears throat> longshore work. And the term stevedore originated in Portugal uh, and Spain uh, many years ago and entered the English language through the sailors who were traveling across the Atlantic. And it started off, off as the phonetic spelling of estivador in Portuguese or estibador in Spanish, meaning a man who loads ships and stores cargo. So estivador is a rather generic term 
almost international in use to uh, describe a, somebody who is involved in the loading and unloading and stowing of cargo. Obviously, this happens in harbors and uh, in ports. Uh, England uses the term dockers. Uh, Australia uses the term wharfies. And in the U.S. and Canada, we primarily use the term longshoremen. Um, I got a question. Uh, I've given a webinar like this in private to a, a U.S. company. And one of the questions I got referred to them as longshore persons, which is acceptable. But the term longshoremen has been longstanding. Uh, and uh, everything is overseen by the Division of Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act, a, a division of the Department of Labor. And it's their mission to minimize the impact of land-based maritime uh, worker employment injuries and deaths. Um, and they ensure that work comp benefits are promptly administered under four major laws. Number one is the one we're going to be focusing on, the Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act, also known as LHWCA, also under the Defense Base Act. And this is longshore benefits extended to U.S. civilians, not military personnel, but U.S. civilians who are injured overseas in military bases. They are provided longshore benefits much the same as uh, stevedores or longshoremen are here in America, and then uh, if if that accident or injury is caused by a war hazard, then there is the ability to subrogate, which normally doesn't exist when you're dealing with uh, the, uh, Kandahar and Afghanistan or some of the foreign bases. But uh, for we do a lot of war hazard reimbursement on behalf of our clients, which, um, as you can imagine, the government's pretty. Uh, a stickler about reimbursing money. We'll talk about that in a little later. Then the other uh, law is the Non-Appropriated Fund Instrumentalities Act and the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. So benefits paid under Longshore and all of these other laws total one and a half billion dollars annually. So let's talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts <clears throat> of Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation. The statute that we're dealing with is a federal statute, uh, 33 United States Code Section 901 at SEC, uh, meaning and following. It provides benefits similar to state workers' compensation laws uh, to all qualifying employees, and an employee is defined as any person engaged in whole or in part in maritime employment, including any longshoreman or other person engaged in longshoring operations and any harbor worker, including a ship repairman, shipbuilder, and ship breaker. <clears throat> the term employee does not include master or member of a crew of any vessel or any person engaged by the master to unload, load, repair vessels under 18 tons. So this creates an interesting confluence between a lot of people bustling around on a port uh, and a wharf who are covered by longshore and a number of people who aren't. And that can create some confusion, which we'll get into. And the act itself compensates for lost wages, medical bills, and rehabilitation to longshore workers, harbor workers, and maritime workers other than employees. Now, <clears throat> the failure of state comp statutes to address longshore exposures coupled with various court rulings denying state workers' compensation benefits really prompted Congress to act. And in 1927, long after most of the states had a state act, Congress acted to pass the Longshore and Harbor Workers' Compensation Act. And it provided, as we said, compensation and medical benefits to anybody involved in the maritime employment, except, of course, members of a crew vessel. Um, three major problems arose in the years following the 1927 passage of the Longshore Act. The courts had a lot of difficulty trying to figure out, trying to parse whether or not the Act or the Longshore Act, the Federal Act, or the State Act applied in a given situation because the Longshore Act failed to clearly delineate jurisdictional boundaries. Another problem that arose is that many maritime workers were injured on a, on a ship um, not only filed a longshore claim, but also sued the, sh sued the ship owner under general maritime law, uh, claiming that the unseaworthiness of the vessel was the cause of the injury. 
and this eventually led to the practice of ship owners requiring an employer of maritime workers to sign a contractual agreement holding the ship ho owner harmless. And we're going to get into a lot of those agreements um, when Jim takes over because that we're going to uh, be dealing with a lot of contractual requirements that may require waivers of subrogation. And lastly, the problem after the 27 Act was a ship owner was being sued by an injured maritime worker. Um, a ship owner who was being sued could would often sue uh, the injured worker's employer on the ground of contributory negligence. So this sort of third party overaction was was common and was sort of <clears throat> um, hindering the the effect of the uh, the Longshore Act. But we struggled through from 1927 to 1972. And in 1972, Congress amended the act and it did the following. It provided, or rather prohibited the injured worker subject to a Longshore Act from filing suit against the vessel owner on the basis of unseaworthiness as seamen could do under the Jones Act. However, it still allowed suit to be brought against any third party, including the vessel owner on the basis of negligence. And we're, Obviously, here at Matisse and Wickert, we're very steeped in, in subrogation. Our goal, our mission is to recover subrogation dollars for our clients. In the longshore context, that involves third-party cases just like it does in workers' compensation. So we'll get into that. Uh, the second problem, or the second thing that the uh, 72 Amendment did, is it made hold harmless agreements between maritime employers and vessel owners unenforceable. Uh, it prohibited those third-party overaction suits that we discussed, and it increased longshore benefits to a point where they were higher, generally, than those often under state comp laws. Why is that important? <clears throat> because we're going to find out a lot of times when there is uh, overlap of jurisdiction, people are choosing longshore benefits, and we've seen a rise in longshore benefit claims, and therefore we should be seeing a concurrent rise in longshore claim reimbursement, subrogation, when a third party exists. So that requires aggressive subrogation techniques in longshore, just like it does in state laws. So um, <clears throat> the uh, CITES tech test was fixed. The status and CITES tests uh, became controversial aspects of the 1972 amendment. They basically um, required you to be a certain status and have a, be at a certain situs or location in order to qualify for coverage under Longshore. They were trying to, to um, skinny down the number of claims that could be filed under Longshore. So under the 72 Amendment now, an employee is any person engaged in whole or in part in maritime employment, including longshoremen or other persons engaged in longshoring operations, and any harbor worker, including ship repairmen, shipbuilders and shipbreakers, but it still does not include master or member of any crew or vessel. So um, in recent years, we've seen that we've had problems in the longshore context that while persons engaged in maritime employment are clearly covered under the act, the act doesn't contain a precise definition of maritime employment. So courts have um, often interpreted that phrase broadly and granted status to clerical workers, airline pilots, and construction workers. So that's kind of adding to the, the congestion uh, in that regard. So in 1984, um, we tried to fix the Longshore Act again, and we actually here have now renamed it for the first time the Longshore and Harbor Workers Compensation Act. And we attempted to limit shoreside coverage by excluding certain types of worker from the definition of employee. So the law now expressly excludes, excludes the following individuals. Um, individuals employed uh, to perform office clerical, secretary, uh, secretarial security or data, data processing work. They could get hurt, slip and fall, whatever, on, on, a, on a wharf, and they are gonna be covered under state law, not longshore. Uh, individuals employed by a club, a camp, recreational operation, restaurant, museum, retail out outlet, not covered. Individuals employed by suppliers, transporters, vendors, uh, and employees of uh, a marina not engaged in construction, expansion of, marine, uh, of the marina, um, including routine maintenance, um, not covered. They're excluded. So the Longshore Act uh, now covers lost wages, 
medical bills, um, uh, wage compensation calculated on 52 weeks of earning, uh, compensation specific for an injured body part, or two-thirds of average weekly wage, and then, of course, death benefits. But we're more interested in recovering money, and uh, we're going to talk more about that. So the dual jurisdiction that we discussed, some actions are covered by both state and federal remedies, and they have to make a choice. Um, some states allow uh, this overlap. Other states eliminate the overlap. In Alaska, for example, there's overlap when the injury on land adjoins navigable water. And when there's over overlap, as we discussed, most choose the Longshore Act as opposed to Al the Alaska Work Comp Act because the benefits are slightly better. Um, <clears throat> now, subrogation law may change that choice. And I, I, I state this because as in any case where you have multiple states engaged in a claim, i.e. accident in Louisiana, employee lives in Texas, Texas benefits paid, um, uh, conflict of law and um, comedy, uh, C-O-M-I-T-Y, in the United States allows us to sometimes argue the application of law other than the law of the state where the accident happened. Well, the same thing is true here, where um, we may want to argue uh, the application of state law as opposed to longshore law. So choices that are made in terms of benefits paid really do make a difference. Um, the um, Washington, for example, exempts state comp if there is a claim under maritime law. And there are 14 states that have sort of um, determined that there is concurrent jurisdiction, including Alabama, Alaska, California. Um, Connecticut calls it crossing the Jensen line. Illinois, you can have concurrent jurisdiction for longshore benefits and state comp benefits for what are known as twilight zone cases. Um, uh, those are cases that are involved in that, as I said, the confluence between maritime activity and land-based activity. It's an area of situations where the injured worker could recover under either. And then uh, the Outer, Outer Continental Shelf um, Lands Act, OSLA, is um, an act that extends longshore benefits to workers injured or killed on fixed structures like oil well platforms that uh, are permanently attached to the Outer Continental Shelf. So, and Jim's going to discuss this more uh, when I turn things over to him. So let's talk subrogation because that, of course, is what we do. And uh, it's great to pay out benefits and uh, see someone through to maximum medical improvement and get them back to work. But it's even better to turn back the hands of time and erase a claim by fully getting reimbursement of all your benefits. The magic statute is uh, Section 933 of uh, 33 U.S. Code. It's also known as simply Section 33. It is the main subrogation and reimbursement section of the Longshore Act. Uh, it says essentially that when an employee has a claim for damages against a third party other than his employer, he can pursue both a civil remedy and collect benefits under the Longshore Act, uh, just like in state comp. And just like in state comp, employees used to have to make a choice. I'm going to choose suing the third party in tort because I'm going to get a whole bunch of damages and become rich. Or, no, I'm going to choose uh, comp benefits because my medical will be paid for. There's no risk. I don't have to worry about a jury uh, declaring that I was 58% at fault. So um, there's no longer an election. An employee can pursue both simultaneously. And... The statute also says, and I'll, I'll read right from the statute, quote, acceptance of compensation under an award in a compensation order filed by the deputy commissioner, an administrative law judge, or the board shall operate as an assignment, close quote, to the employer of third-party rights. What does this mean? This means that when there is a formal award for longshore benefits, something magical happens. The employee has the right to file suit for the first six months, but then the employer, and that includes the, the longshore carrier, 
then has 90 days to file, and this is an exclusive right in which it has to file suit. After 90 days, the right reverts back to the employee. Um, there are many reasons why we want to be the ones to activate that lawsuit in those 90 days. Um, we have complete control. We can recover, as you'll see later on, uh, the present value of benefits owed in the future, something you cannot do under state comp. So um, this means now that if a formal comp award is entered, there's an assignment. If a formal comp award is not entered, there is no statutory counterpart part of 933E, which is the assignment where payments are made to an employee without a formal award being entered. And uh, the subrogation right where there is no award isn't addressed in the statute. So what does that mean? Does that mean because not every Longshore Act has a formal award? If there isn't a formal award and we just start paying benefits, there still is a judicial creation of uh, a right of reimbursement. So in cases where the employee himself sues the third party tortfeasors, the courts have recognized a right of the longshore worker, um, the longshore carrier rather, to be reimbursed to the extent of payments made, and they've enabled and given us the right to intervene into that third party suit filed by the, the employee. So it is only the right of control of the third party action against the third persons which a carrier foregoes by paying compensation without an award. It's, um, it's right to reimbursement out of the recovery for the employee's injury remains unaffected. So following an award of compensation then, the employee has six months to commence an action against the third party. If the employee fails to do this, then the right shifts to the carrier for 90 days. And after 90 days, if no claim has been made by the carrier, if we are sitting on our thumbs, then the right reverts back to the injured employee. And uh, during that 90-day assignment period, our control of the worker's cause of action is exclusive. But as we'll see, if the employee files, his right of his cause of action is not exclusive. During the assignment period, um, the employer can either file suit or settle the third party case with or, or without filing suit. Um, the carrier has the ability to um, uh, do, do anything it wants, essentially. We have complete control of the cause of action. And where the employer is insured under nine, uh, Section 33H, the statute says where the employer is insured and the insurance carrier has assumed the payment, the insurance carrier is subrogated to the rights of the employer under this section because we'll find, and we'll discuss this in a little more detail, that uh, quite often we have, um, as you know, every effort in the world to get us to eliminate or reduce our longshore liens are undertaken by plaintiff's counsel, and good for them. That's their job. It's they're, they're ethically bound to recover and recoup as much as possible for their injured clients. And that uh, includes efforts to reduce the longshore lien. So I hear, I hear a lot of times them arguing that, well, you're the carrier, you don't have the right, you have to do so in the name of the employer, please judge dismiss this case. Or I have uh, arguments, in fact, I'm handling one with uh, my partner out in our California, our Los Angeles office right now, in which the plaintiffs, the California plaintiffs attorney is arguing that, okay, longshore benefits may have been paid, but California public policy requires that subrogation rights be governed under the California Workers' Compensation Act. I got to give them credit for creativity, but it is not going to fly. That isn't going to stop them from trying it, however. So, um, where an employer files in, where an employee files suit uh, and makes a recovery, the employer has a right of reimbursement. As we said, sections uh, subsections F and G of section uh, 33 address how a third party recovery is, is apportioned when the employee files suit. Um, again, the Longshore Act doesn't expressly provide for reimbursement in this instance, but the courts have said the carrier is entitled to reimbursement. And there's two very, very well known, um, including one recent uh, Fifth Circuit cases that confirm that. 
933F says that when the employee files suit, the employer owes benefits beyond, quote, the net amount of the recovery. So this is a simple formula um, where you, you simply all we're going to owe is anything beyond what the employee recovers. Uh, compared to, to subsection E, which we'll discuss in a few, a few slides later, when the carrier files suit. So again, we're talking about when the employee files suit, um, the plaintiff cannot settle around the lien, and our lien attaches to any third-party recovery. Section uh, 33G gives the employer carrier uh, the right to approve or reject the settlement in writing. This is... Um, this is very significant because this is a notice requirement that we don't have, the carrier doesn't have when we can file suit, but when the employee files suit, he or she must get consent of our consent, uh, either the carrier or the employer, if the amount of the settlement is less than the future obligation that is owed. Um, the claimant or the employee must obtain prior written approval of the employer and the carrier on DLL, on the Department of Labor form LS33, known as the approval of compromise of third party cause of action. I'll show you that in the next slide. If the employee fails to do this, future benefits are terminated. And that creates some danger for the plaintiff's counsel. So uh, whether the recovery is for more or less than the compensation due and owing, the employer or carrier is entitled to set off any net recovery from the tort case uh, against the benefits that are owed. Note that, and this is important because Jim is going to talk about subrogation waivers, but even if subrogation is waived, all right, ding, 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 if you're going to remember anything, remember this because it costs our clients lots of money. Even if subrogation is waived, the employee must still get consent of the employer or the carrier to settle. And I said, as I said, Jim will discuss waivers in just a minute. So um, uh, that's, that's, a, that's key and that's something we should keep in mind. And here is the LS33 form. Uh, it records the third party compromise. It documents the carrier's consent and it is used when, if the plaintiff is settling the third party case for what? Less than the longshore lien. And it has to be filed within when? 30 days of settlement. So keep that in mind, it's an important form. Now, what about when, when the employee files suit, apportionment goes something like this. Um, any recovery via settlement or judgment is apportioned as follows. The employee gets attorney's fees and litigation costs off the top. Make sure litigation costs are legitimate litigation costs necessary to litigate the case. Loans to a client are not litigation expenses, but they will be tried to be passed off as such on occasion. Uh, next, the employer or the carrier gets paid back past compensation and medical Right now, it sounds a lot like a lot of state acts, doesn't it? Uh, next, any remaining balance is paid to the employee, and that remaining balance paid to the employee constitutes a future credit in the amount of the employee's net recovery. Uh, so the employer receives this future credit, and um, that that is an important aspect, and sometimes the most important aspect in catastrophic cases. Note that the employee cannot settle around a longshore carrier. Um, so in order for, um, um, when the employee files suit, the employee, the employee files suit, the employer is entitled to be reimbursed for past compensation and medical from the net proceeds of any third party recovery. And there's cases that, that indicate that. Um, now, what about when the employer files suit? When the employer files suit, it's a little different. We're talking about a different section now. Remember the 90-day, the six-month rule? When the employer is the one to file suit, some good things happen. Um, number one, we have exclusive control of the suit. The employee doesn't even have a say. Uh, and we are entitled to settle it for whatever and whenever we want. Any recovery, settlement, or judgment is distributed as follows. Now we, the employer, the carrier, get attorney's fees and costs as determined by the deputy commissioner or the board. 
Now we recover our past lien, um, which is described and defined as cost, the cost of all benefits furnished to the employee under Section 7, which is medical expenses, and so Section 7B of the Act, 907B, which is all amounts paid as compensation. So again, we have exclusive control when we file. The employee doesn't have that same right when he files. And um, during that time period, the employee is forbidden from commencing a suit. And I've had cases where it's our magical time and the employee files suit and the defendants are kind of hush-hush because they know that that suit isn't legitimate and because our interests are aligned with the plaintiffs, we sometimes have to enter into some judgments, even an assignment of a claim we're allowed. So there, there are some complexities that, uh, that are involved here. So uh, when the employer files, any recovery, settlement, or judgment is distributed as follows. We get attorney fees and costs. We get compensation uh, reimbursed. We get medical reimbursed. And the employer recovers the present value and that's a, a key term, the present value of future comp benefits owed. And those are computed in accordance with um, the, uh, the, the, the work or the Longshore Act and in accordance with the schedule that the secretary has, has prepared. Um, literally, we're entitled to retain the present value of future compensation benefits, which will be determined for us as a trust fund to pay compensation and the cost of benefits as they become due. So section 33E, unlike section 33F, speaks in terms of present value and a trust fund mechanism, which is, imposes the risk of a reasonable return and um, uh, that risk falls on the employee when we file suit. So how do you calculate compensation benefits? Um, and when do we have to continue to pay benefits after a settlement? Uh, well, the employee is going to argue, and this gets a little bit nuanced, but just generally, just so you know, there's an issue here. The employee argues that compensation resumes when the total amount of benefits they would have received is, exceeds the tort recovery. We, on the other hand, are going to argue that um, the compensation offset, we uh, we should re we should reduce the accrued compensation to present value like in 933E, there's a debate going on. But in general, um, when the employee files or the employer files suit, we have a little bit uh, more leverage and be better things happen for us. Now, one of the problems that we've discussed in state workers' compensation that is a real problem, uh, in some states more than others, is the gerrymandering of settlements. What happens if they settle a case and allocate 100% of the damages to pain and suffering? Well, there are states that say we're only entitled to subrogate for medical expenses and lost wages, i.e. economic damages. Not so in Longshore. Um, that's why plaintiff's lawyers try to get us uh, to pigeonhole or, or um, cubbyhole our recovery rights under state comp acts because they're more restrictive. But subrogation applies to all damages in Longshore and anything recovered in the third party case, including pain and suffering. Um, when you're dealing with death cases, we are only subrogated to the third party proceeds recovered by Longshore beneficiaries. So if a state death act, wrongful death act or survival act allows someone to recover damages like an aunt or uncle who doesn't receive benefits, then there is a risk that an astute trial lawyer will try to sho uh, shovel a lot of the recovery over to Uncle Bob, to whom we cannot receive a reimbursement from. So we have to make sure that the apportionment is specified in the settlement agreement. We have to make sure that the apportionment is reasonable, and um, the burden is on us to prove the amount that's subject to subrogation. So this is the Achilles heel of Longshore, which is generally pretty strong, Longshore subrogation. Um, the ALJ or the board is entitled to set aside a settlement if it's unfair. And generally what we do is we have a brief we file, we note all the public policy behind Longshore, how it holds down premiums and uh, all the other normal benefits of subrogation. 
And then we argue that clearly giving 90% of the recovery to Uncle Bob, who's only showed up on Easter the last two years, is obviously an artifice. It's an attempt to gerrymander the settlement so as to do what trial lawyers do, and that is increase the recovery for their clients, but it shouldn't stand, and it normally does not. Some courts state that if the settlement agreement doesn't specify that the lien in credit goes against the entire settlement, but those um, that's the exception rather than the rule. And uh, we maintain that the administrative law judge has to conduct a hearing on that issue. So now, once we've gotten our money back, the question becomes, do we have to keep paying benefits? Well, the answer is no. Um, in order to calculate uh, the Section 33F credit, um, by the way, the, the section provides that the carrier must pay, quote, a sum equal to the excess of the, of the amount which the secretary determines is payable on account of such injury or death over the net amount recovered against such person. Okay, that's the way the government says something which could be said much simpler, and that is we get a credit for the net recovery. Um, and so they, they back into it backwards and add a whole lot more words, but it means the same thing. And we get a credit for the net recovery. We are entitled to a credit or offset for the net amount of the injured employee's recovery. If the third party recovery is less than what the employer or the carrier would be required to, to pay, um, we pay only the difference between the third party recovery and the compensation. So regardless of whether the recovery is more or less than the compensation due, the employer is entitled to set off any net recovery from a third party. Now, if, if death is involved, um, then the employer is entitled to a credit only for the net amount received from post-death post third-party settlements by non-dependent children. Uh, again, if, death, if there's a death, the employer is entitled to a credit only for the net amount received from post-death third-party settlements by non-dependent children. And moreover, the, the board maintains that the employer bears the burden of proof on these. So death cases becomes, as we've seen, a little trickier. Uh, Congress hadn't thought through this, mainly because the people writing it probably weren't lawyers, and they never tried a long short case, and, and they never tried an action over a third-party case, so they just didn't think about it. But we have to think about it. So uh, first determine the net amount recovered by the employee, then compare that net amount to the amount due as compensation. If it's more, no further payments are necessary. File your, your, your paperwork. If it's less, the carrier only owes the difference between the recovery and the compensation that is due. Now I wanna just make uh, honorable mention here to uh, the special injury um, or the special uh, injury fund, the second injury fund known as the special fund uh, under the Longshore Act. And just generally, it's a fund established um, that was established way back in 1927. Um, they operate this special fund to provide benefits in cases in which the employer or carrier cannot pay for any reason or in which benefits must be paid for a second injury under Section 8F. A second injury is covered by uh, Section 8F with longshore benefits if the employee who was previously partially disabled on the job gets injured again and because of the combination of the first injury and second injury it renders him uh, partially or totally disabled then the use of special funds is designed to lessen the risk uh, associated with hiring partially disabled employees it's supposed to encourage employers go ahead hire that guy I, I realize he's uh, pretty fragile right now and he could get hurt and be totally disabled uh, because the special fund will kick in and there's subrogation rights that go with that as well. Um, less, less concern in many cases, but I wanted to mention it. Now the Defense Base Act, which we talked about earlier, is um, something I want to mention because now longshore benefits are paid for uh, persons employed at military, air, and naval bases outside the United States. And in particular, we can think of them in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, where you have civilians employed uh, in many, many facets of, uh, of support. And benefits, longshore benefits and coverage uh, covers U.S. civilian contractors no matter where they are. And as long as you're working under a contract with the federal government, um, and it's it's operated the same way, same sort of benefits. Um, the problem is <clears throat> subrogation can be be quite difficult 
Um, and it's often difficult to prove liability on a third party when you're in another country. And even when you can, there's all sorts of jurisdictional questions, hostile foreign land, there's armed conflicts. So recovery is difficult, but not impossible with, with DBA claims. But in one area where it is possible, and this is uh, an area that we've been involved in quite heavily and have a number of paralegals preparing uh, tens of thousands of pages of medical records, uh, the, the War Hazard Act um, is an extension, uh, and it, it, whenever longshore benefits are applied under the Defense Base Act, it pays benefits to government contractors as a result of the hostile force or person or an injury or death due to a war risk hazard. The government has said, look, we don't want companies not to go support our military. Therefore, we are, as public policy, we're going to reimburse Liberty Mutual, uh, Hartford, whatever, whoever the carrier is providing longshore benefits, we're going to simply reimburse them. No questions asked if the injury is a result of a war risk hazard. Now, that sounds too good to be true, and, and it is, because the burden is, is significant to properly and successfully make a war hazard reimbursement application. It takes uh, uh, hundreds, dozens of hours, if not hundreds, <clears throat> to gather all the medical records. Everything has to be completely documented. Every medical bill, what it's for, you have to prove that a war risk hazard caused the injury. And if you happen to charge a premium for the war hazard coverage, there's no reimbursement. And so what you do is you file a form, uh, statements, medical records. It's essentially like an arbitration, but there's no second chance. So you file it and you hope that you get to your recovery. And that's something we've been doing quite actively. Um, I'm going to just quick, quickly do our trivia question. Our trivia question is um, as follows. The first true offshore overwater oil well not accessed by a pier was drilled in what state? The first true offshore overwater oil well not accessed by a pier was drilled in what state? which state? California, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, or Texas? Remember, send your, quite your answers to Jamie uh, using the... Um, the uh, what, what did you say, Jamie? The question pane. I always forget what it's called. Uh, so again, the first true offshore overwater well not accessed by a pier was drilled in what state? California, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, or Texas? Now quickly to, to finish up with my part of this, um, again, third parties now, I just want to address generally, just like in work comp, um, an employee is the first party, a carrier is the second party. Guess who the third party is? They're the ones with the target on their back. They're the ones that we're going after. Longshore um, benefits are an exclusive remedy against an employer, and um, sometimes um, uh, some vessel owners provide their own stevedoring services so they can wear two hats. In some cases, a vessel owner can also be a third party uh, and be liable as a vessel owner. It's known as a burnside action. So an employee must prove uh, in order to succeed that there's vessel-based negligence distinct and separate from employer-based negligence. And um, this is a, an area that can get quite confusing because certain, certain vessel owners have contracts and provide all their own stevedoring services. So you have their employees out there acting as stevedores. Remember the, Jim, were you gonna say something? No, no, I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, so just remember that under Section 5B, the claimant can file a third-party act against the vessel, and that includes vessel owner, an owner pro hoc vice, an agent, an operator, a charter, or bare-bone charter, or a master, officer, a crew member, any of those guys. Any of those people leave something laying on the ground and a longshoreman trips over it, you've got a third-party action <clears throat> on a 905B claim. And the difference is, is somewhat nuanced. Um, 
Continuing with uh, third-party uh, cases, when you have a Jones Act, seamen or crew members can sue their employer if their fellow workers or shipmasters are negligent. Uh, this is a remedy provided to sailors for injuries resulting from the negligence of a fellow sailor or the owner or operator of the vessel. Um, and Jones Act and Longshore are mutually exclusive compensation regimes, and that so the employee whose job title fits one of the encumbered or enumerated occupations under the Longshore Act, longshoremen, ship repairmen, can also be seamen excluded from the Longshore coverage and entitled to pursue a Jones Act. Uh, that means that if a plaintiff uh, satisfies the criteria for being a seaman, he is covered by the Jones Act and not the Longshore Act. Um, just it's important to keep keep that in mind. And then again, the Outer Continental Shelf Act, which Jim will discuss uh, <clears throat> here in about a minute, establishes that the federal government's title and jurisdiction over underwater lands, um, uh, and, and that, that jurisdiction applies to oil rig workers, maintenance staff, roustabouts who work on those offshore facilities. We've seen the movie Deep, Deep, Deepwater Horizon. Um, uh, those, those, those will come into play under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Um, so I want, this is probably, um, the last thing I'm gonna leave you with is probably the highlight, as we know in state workers' compensation, anytime you have a third party case and a lien is reimbursed, plaintiff's attorneys are gonna make a, what, what they generically call a common fund claim for attorney's fees out of your lien recovery. Actually, it's a statutory lien recovery or a statutory claim for attorney's fees. Um, and it can be quite annoying when you've done work or, or perhaps have preserved the evidence and the plaintiff's attorney sends one letter and I want you to reduce your lien by 40%. Um, <clears throat> for many years, carriers subrogated without owing fees or costs. And in 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 1984 amendment, uh, the the uh, statute said Congress amended the Longshore Act and provided that the injured worker who pursues litigation is entitled title to costs um, off the top as well as reasonable attorney's fees. But as in some states, a minority of states in state work comp, the carrier has the right to a total satisfaction of its worker's compensation lien, despite the fact that many uh, trial lawyers will tell you, well, we know we want to make a common fund claim out of your longshore lien. Well, that doesn't fly because they're talking about an equitable, equitable doctrine, the common fund doctrine under a particular state, and that is all preempted by the Longshore Act. So we do not owe fees <clears throat> to the plaintiff's attorney out of our lien. We should be able to receive 100% reimbursement. If you're settling for less than 100%, perhaps we're doing something wrong. You really don't have to do in many, many cases. So. At this point, I want to turn you over to Jim, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, litigated with me in Texas Maritime and Jones Act. And um, this is going to get into one of the trickier aspects of um, Longshore. Uh, and with that, I will uh, turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Gary. Um, I'm going to see if I have actual control over the slides now by flipping it. To the next one. All right, there we go. Um, other than whether or not the third party is going to be actually liable for the injury to the worker, the probably the thing that's going to affect your right of subrogation the most with a longshore subrogation claim is whether there's a waiver of subrogation in the applicable contract. Um, most of the longshore subrogation claims we see on, on the Gulf Coast arise out of oil field work. That's the predominant industry down here and the industry that, that triggers most of this coverage, uh, both offshore and also within the territorial waters of the various states down here. Um, oil field companies have become very sophisticated at drawing up contracts which contain defense and indemnity obligations um, and also contain waivers of subrogation clauses. Um, so sometimes when you're in your office and you get in a new claim, um, immediately you have a letter from either um, a third party oil company or maybe from the claimant's counsel himself saying, hey, there's a waiver of subrogation. You don't have a right of subrogation here. 
or maybe you've gotten the contract yourself immediately and have uh, looked at this and discovered the issue yourself. Um, just because you've got a waiver of subrogation that's in the master service agreement, perhaps, or, uh, or the con otherwise known as the contract, um, just because you have that doesn't mean you should throw in the towel just yet. There's a number of things that you um, analysis to go through. There's a number of statutes that may apply that we're going to go through that may give you a very good right of subrogation and a claim that you thought you had none. One of the first things we're going to look at is whether the, the scope of the waiver itself includes particular accident that gave rise to the potential litigation. Uh, a common limitation in some waivers of subrogation is to only waive subrogation for claims arising from the work to be performed by the party granting the waiver of subrogation. Sometimes such uh, waivers are phrased as limiting the waiver of subrogation to work that's performed under the contract. Since the waiver of subrogation is only applicable when there's been a personal injury or, or property loss for the party granting the waiver of subrogation, the injury loss would typically arise out of the performance of the contract, and you know, in that case, the waiver would be effective. However, sometimes you've got multiple companies that are doing different jobs on the site, and a separate contract can be applicable to that work that's going on. So you gotta make sure that you're dealing with the correct contract. Also, sometimes the waiver of subrogation is limited to a waiver um, for personal injuries to the employee of the party granting the waiver. Um, this type of waiver is usually in effect when the contracting parties are concerned about liabilities for personal injuries and they, they want to preserve the rights against each other for those property damages. Less common but seen uh, more and more recently are waivers of subrogation which granted a waiver of subrogation only to the extent of indemnity obligations assumed under the contract. An example of that kind of language is that our next slide here. All of the insurance policies of the contractor shall be endorsed to waive subrogation against the client with respect to all liabilities and indemnity obligations assumed by the contractor under this agreement. Now that language sounds, you know, innocuous a little bit, and a lot of people just sort of skim over that, but that language is very important because it's a limitation. It's limiting the waiver to all liabilities and indemnity obligations assumed under the contract. Um, so, you know, if you've got a broad indemnity obligation, the waiver is still going to be, you know, general in its scope. But in some circumstances, when you're looking at the indemnity obligation in the contract, it could be limited um, for a variety of reasons. You can also have the indemnification set forth shall not extend to injury or death of indemnitors personnel caused by the indemnity's negligence. That's also very important because very often that's what happened. The accident was caused by the indemnity's negligence. The effect of the limitation for acts of one's own negligence um, is to allow indemnification when the other party of the contract committed an act of negligence which caused the complaint of loss. By limiting a waiver of subrogation to the indemnification obligations um, in such contract, a waiver of subrogation would only be effective as to the negligence by the party granting the waiver. It would not be effective as to negligence of the other party to the contract. This can be uh, very important and essentially renders the waiver of subrogation ineffectual. Um, we talked earlier about um, the limitation just a few slides ago of, uh, caused by um, when that's limited with respect to all liabilities and indemnity obligations under the contract. We've had a lot of cases in Texas recently on that, and a lot of good cases have come down in our favor on um, determining that the waiver of subrogation doesn't apply. All right, it's also very important to determine which companies might benefit from the waiver of subrogation. A large corporation contracting with a contractor will typically include as a party benefiting under the contract and benefiting the, you know, the waiver, uh, will include itself, their subsidiaries, affiliated companies. Um, but sometimes in the commercial context, the, the contracting corporation will also include other contractors, subcontractors. They'll throw out a really general term like invitees. Um, the definition of the parties under the contract can be very important 
in determining whether the waiver of subrogation is going to apply. Here's an example of, of, of sort of a generic one that the um, parties that are going to benefit by the waiver are going to be the client, its parents, subsidiaries, affiliated companies, joint ventures, partners, co-owners, and their respective officers, employees, agents, and invitees. All right, so if the definition also, though, goes beyond this and includes all contractors and subcontractors, then the waiver of subrogation is going to benefit not only the company entering, in, entering into the contract with your insured, but also the other companies that might be on the work site. For example, if a contractor is on a site and its worker is injured due to um, due the negligence of another contractor who is working in the same area, the waiver of subrogation may also benefit that other contractor um, if that other contractor is included within the definitions under the contract. Um, this language is off, often buried deep into the contract. You really got to go in there and find it. Sometimes it's under the context of the name of the company group. Um, company group is, is often generic term and then it's specifically defined um, in another paragraph to include all contractors, subcontractors, and invitees. Um, that's that term invitees again. That's a little bit of a, a problem sometimes. It's often argued um, that any party that's even on the property at all um, and has permission to be on the property is an invitee and therefore benefits from the waiver of subrogation. Um, but many courts have refused to extend invitee status to contractors and subcontractors who are on the site when those contractors and subcontractors are not explicitly included under the definition of the company group or otherwise to, you know, parties to the contract. The rationale there is that the parties could have included the words contractors and subcontractors within the company group but they didn't do so. They Instead, they throw this generic term of invitees. And courts like specific terms, not generic terms. And so they, you know, sometimes they've ruled that the generic term of invitee does not provide adequate notice to the parties as to who benefits from the waiver of subrogation. So you've gone through the contract. Um, You've had people go through it and go through the terms we've been talking about to find out does the contract by its very own terms apply. Um, oftentimes, and this, this sounds you know a little bit incongruous, but oftentimes people forget to actually check the policy language. Um, a lot of times they assume that, well, of course, if there is a contractual waiver of subrogation, there must be a waiver of subrogation in the policy. Or sometimes parties assume that there doesn't need to be an express waiver of subrogation clause in the policy of insurance itself, in the longshore policy. Um, but there does. Courts over and over have ruled that it's not enough just to have a waiver of subrogation agreement in the contract that if the insurance company who's written the longshore claim and paid the benefits and wants to subrogate, if you're going to bind that insurance company to a contractual waiver of subrogation that it's insured has, has entered into, you've got to have the agreement of the insurance company as evidenced by the policy itself. The thing to remember there, of course, is if you look in the policy and, hey, there is no waiver of subrogation um, endorsement at all, or maybe the waiver of subrogation endorsement doesn't apply, um, there are going to be business ramifications um, with that sometimes. Sometimes there's going to be a breach of contract suit that is going to be filed against the insured um, by the other party to the contract because um, the insured side of contract saying that they would get a waiver of subrogation from their insurance company and they failed to do so. Or maybe it was the insurance agent who failed to do so. Um, so there are going to be you know rabbit holes that go down there, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't stand by the language of your policy and in the appropriate case, um, say that there's no waiver of subrogation. So here's one example of a waiver of subrogation endorsement that um, quite often that you're going to see. Um, it's going to, um, this is one where you have to have a specific company named in the schedule. And, uh, and if that company is named there, then um, there'll be a waiver of subrogation. Um, a lot of times issues come up because there may be, if it's just written like this and there's just a company name in there, and let's say it's Apache USA that is in there, um, but it turns out that the contract is not by Apache USA and there's not any um, broad language applying it to subsidiaries, but the contract is, is with a um, Apache Drilling um, Inc. And, and not Apache USA Inc., then, um, then this waiver may not apply uh, or this endorsement may not apply to them. 
You can also have what's known as a blanket waiver of subrogation. I apologize, it's a little bit hard to read here, but essentially a blanket waiver of subrogation says the insurance company agrees to waive subrogation as to um, any um, any time the insured has entered into um, a written contract that requires a waiver of subrogation. So it's it's not limited. It's not limited um, to a specific company. It's not limited to a specific uh, job. It's just um, there. You know, the insured is waiving subrogation, and the insurance company is agreeing to be bound by that in exchange for premium. However, there's, you know, usually even with a blanket waiver of subrogation, there's a requirement that the insured must have executed the contract prior to the loss. So you can't have a situation where there's a large loss and all of a sudden everybody hurriedly um, uh, does a um, does a master service agreement that requires waiver of subrogation and gets their insurance agent to send in a request for a blanket waiver um, and they, they ask for the um, endorsement to um, be retroactive back to the beginning of the policy. We've seen that before. Um, that typically is not going to fly if you have protective language in your blanket waiver that says that it's not applicable um, to that extent. Also, waivers of subrogation have to be in writing. You can't have oral waivers of subrogation. Your insurer can't waive your subrogation rights just by an oral agreement. It's got to be in writing pretty much everywhere. Another common form of a waiver of subrogation endorsement provides um, that um, the waiver of subrogation is effective by written contract in favor of specific entities named in the endorsement. Um, if the party claiming the waiver of subrogation is not the party specifically named in the endorsement or in the insurance schedule, we saw that example a couple slides ago, then the waiver is not effective. Um, that comes into play also with the company group definition. Um, even though a waiver of subrogation is signed by the insurer and allows a waiver to other parties, if the waiver of subrogation endorsement only lists the company that signed the contract by name, then only that company is going to benefit by the waiver of subrogation. Another waiver of subrogation endorsement limitation is to provide a waiver for subrogation by written contract, but only for injuries arising from work performed by the party that granted the waiver of subrogation. So this is a another more limited form of a waiver. It's the intent of that is to say, well, okay, you agreed to waive subrogation as to company A, um, but we're only going to um, allow that waiver as the insurance company um, for claims that arise out of that work for company A, not for work that you're doing on the site, maybe with another, another party or another contractor. Um, limits it to the work actually being performed for that company. Before we move on from the topic of, uh, of, of the, the policy itself, um, a few other things that are important to note. Oftentimes, um, if you're a, a longshore adjuster, you'll be, prevented with, um, you'll be presented with a certificate of insurance um, that explicitly provides that a waiver of subrogation is supposed to be obtained. Um, and oftentimes, that'll be presented to you as evidence that you were supposed to get a waiver in the policy or that there's a, there is an effective waiver in the policy. Um, None of that means any of that. A certificate of insurance for purposes of coverage doesn't really isn't really worth the, the paper it's written on. All a certificate of insurance is is it's an insurance agent's um, promise, if you will, or certification that um, this policy was supposed to have a waiver of subrogation in it. Um, but that doesn't mean that the policy actually does have a waiver of subrogation in it. It doesn't actually mean that the contract um, has an enforceable waiver of subrogation in it. Um, so certificate is, is just something written by the insurance agent. It's often done for business purposes, often in a hurry. Um, an owner of a business may need that certificate so that they can bid on a job. And so they'll, they'll get the agent to, to write up the certificate, um, providing that there's a waiver of subrogation in their policy for that company they're bidding the job for. And then they don't get that job and they never put that company on the on the you know, actual policy for a waiver. Um, and, you know, insurance companies mess up. They have um, clerks that are reviewing these things um, that oftentimes um, may not um, request the applicable coverage. The um, insurance agent who's called about it might be the business broker who's involved in the sales side, but not necessarily the procurement or the policy side. Um, sometimes there's a breakdown of communication between the agent and the insurance company itself, where the agent has actually sent in the request for the waiver and it was not processed due to some issue with the insurance company. Um, that can get hairy sometimes. 
If you have a situation where it's clear that there was supposed to be a waiver of subrogation in the policy, you've got a certificate of insurance saying that there was supposed to be. The master service agreement is fairly clear there's supposed to be. But your policy does not actually include a waiver of subrogation in it. Um, it might be prudent of you, and I usually ask my clients to, to review or send me so that I can review the underwriting file. Um, a lot of times companies hate to, to pull together their entire underwriting file, but um, you can learn a lot from the underwriting file. Sometimes there has been a mistake. It was the intent of the policy to waive subrogation. And you don't want to be two years into a longshore case where you've asserted subrogation rights by arguing that there's no waiver of subrogation because it's not in your policy and find out that the only reason it wasn't in your policy is because of some mistake in your underwriting department. Um, that is, is not good and is a big waste of everybody's time. So in some circumstances, you gotta, you got to dive deep into the underwriting file. All right, so there are a number of statutes that are applicable. Even if you've got a waiver of subrogation in, in your master service agreement, you've got a, a um, waiver of subrogation endorsement in your policy, everything applies. Um, certain acts, um, especially in Texas, Louisiana, New Mexico, and Wyoming, um, are going to, um, can often apply to um, invalidate those waivers of subrogation and still give you subrogation rights. However, they're, they're very tricky. Um, we could spend a whole seminar another hour and a half just talking about oil field indemnity acts, just talking about certain aspects of oil field indemnity acts. So the intent of this is not to um, teach you everything about that, but we're gonna go through some of the important issues in that regard. Typically the reason why these apply is um, a lot of times it's because of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Um, if you've got a longshore claim that arises within territorial waters, um, within the three miles, then, then the state law is going to apply. You know, the, the Texas um, Oil Field Indemnity Act might apply, the Louisiana might apply. But if you are beyond the three miles, those acts still are going to apply through the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act because um, the OCSLA um, determines that it's going to be applied, it's federal law, um, and then only, you know, when it's not inconsistent with applicable federal law. When there are gaps in federal law, uh, um, the, OS, uh, the OCSLA adopts the law of the adjacent state, such as Louisiana, as surrogate federal law to the extent that the adjacent state's law is applicable and not inconsistent with the OCSLA or other acts um, and, and regulations. So um, the courts have said over and over again that the Oil Field Indemnity Acts are not inconsistent with the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. So, um, they will apply. So if you are five miles and you are five miles off the coast of Louisiana, um, you look at the um, map um, to see which district you're in um, and you look and see what the adjacent state is, um, which sometimes, you know, the way geography is can be an argument as to whether or not it, it's actually Texas or Louisiana, which is technically the adjacent state. Um, but for the most part, these districts have been broken down and you can tell where you are. Um, there's maps that will show you that. There's cases that have determined it. Um, so then you could say you, you would go to Louisiana if you're offshore Louisiana or, or Texas if you're offshore Texas. Um, it's awfully, sometimes it's tricky to determine which of these um, oil field um, indemnity acts, um, if they are going to apply or not. Um, Louisiana's act probably has the most litigation about it simply because there's Louisiana has a very long coastline. It's got a tradition of servicing the oil field and, um, and oil, oil and gas industry offshore. So a lot of the um, workers work in Louisiana. A lot of the um, helicopters will fly into Louisiana from the oil rigs. The ships will go back and forth. Um, so it, it tends to come up um, quite, quite often. What the Act provides, the Louisiana Act, it says any provision, any agreement which requires waivers of subrogation, additional named insured endorsements, or any other form of insurance protection which would frustrate or circumvent the prohibitions of this section shall be null and void and of no force and effect. Now, um, like I said, we could go through a whole other seminar about when the Act applies, when it doesn't. There's language in the Act. Um, for example, the Louisiana Act pertains to a well. Um, there's a lot of litigation um, and cases re regarding well, whether or not a specific accident pertains to a well. 
Um, if maritime, if it's a maritime contract, then um, the Ophio Indemnity Act is not going to apply in Louisiana or in Texas for that matter. Um, so you have to determine whether or not it's a maritime contract. It's a lot of hoops to get through, but once you get to the point that you think the act applies, um, then you look at the language of the act. And this language here that says, um, which would frustrate or circumvent the prohibitions of this section, um, that provides a discretionary loophole for the court. There's a lot of cases where you say, wow, it looks like the act actually applies, but then the court determines that it doesn't because it decides that the waiver of subrogation doesn't frustrate or circumvent the prohibitions of the section. Um, the Fifth Circuit um, cases have refused to invalidate waivers of subrogation clause even though the Anti-Indemnity Act in Louisiana applies if the indemnity has not sought indemnification. Um, so, you know, basically what happens is if, if you're seeking, if the other company is seeking to enforce the indemnification, then the waiver's void. If they're not seeking to enforce indemnification, then the waiver is not going to be a void. Uh, the idea is they they want to sort of they want to try to prevent a double a situation where the the employer and their companies are paying twice, where they're taking over indemnification and then they also have to waive subrogation. Um, but the intent of what the way they they did it really strips um, the act of any of its meaning because that the act applies um, if the other company. Um, is going to seek indemnity. Um, if, the, if, the, if, if the act is applying, then the other company won't even seek indemnity because they know that the act applies. So you kind of got a, a problem there in that regard. And there's a lot of cases that, that have come down recently in Louisiana on, on these long short claims that have, have said, you know, hey, sorry, um, you know, there, we think that the waiver does not frustrate the intent of the act, so we're not going to allow the waiver in these circumstances. Texas Oil Code Act, um, you know, it's, it's similar in its intent, but it actually has um, a lot of provisions that um, you know, are a little bit different. It, it provides that the indemnification provision in a contract pertains to an oil and gas well that purports to indemnify a person against loss or liability for damages that result from the negligence of the indemnity and arise from personal injury, death, or property injury is against public policy and void unless the conditions of another part of the act are met. You know, one of those main things is if you have mutual um, insurance obligations under the contract and they're not going to enforce, um, they're, they're not going to apply um, invalidate indemnity. You notice that the act doesn't say anything about waivers of subrogation. Um, however, Texas courts have determined, here's an example one, um, where the, um, the Houston court um, had a case where the insurer argued that the Indemnity Act invalidated the waiver of subrogation. The court concluded that it, it did not, um, but only because the waiver of subrogation in the contract was mutual, and as we said, mutual indemnity obligations were allowed. And the, the way the court got to that is they, they treated waivers of subrogation as indemnity agreements. So even though the act doesn't say we invalidate waivers of subrogation, it says we invalidate indemnity obligations. Um, and the court has decided that a waiver of subrogation is essentially an indemnity obligation because you are taking on, by waiving subrogation, you're taking on a loss that somebody else has been responsible for. So there are other acts as well that affect, um, can come into play with Longshore that have indemnity and, and waivers of subrogation issues. Um, there are construction statutes now in a number of states. Um, Louisiana has one. Um, they've enacted in any indemnity statutes which bar indemnity in construction contracts or agreements. Um, almost uniformly, however, these contracts don't specifically reference waivers of subrogation. Um, so you're back kind of the situation that you had with the Texas Oil Field Indemnity Act that oftentimes you have to argue, argue that even though a construction anti-indemnity statute does not specifically bar a waiver of subrogation, the waiver of subrogation by its very nature is a shifting of liability and therefore an indemnity clause, which is barred by the um, anti-indemnity statute, is the same thing as a waiver of subrogation clause. <clears throat> 
you also have a uh, you have states that have enacted anti indemnity statutes um, which bar indemnification in transportation agreements um, such as contracts for carriage of goods. Um, just like construction and indemnity statutes, these statutes rarely address waivers of subrogation, um, and so you're you're there you're arguing that an indemnity um, obligation is the same thing as a waiver of subrogation. And that argument can vary from state to state. It works very well in Texas because you have a lot of um, case law in Texas saying that. It doesn't work as well in Louisiana quite often because you have some case law in Louisiana that, that differentiates between indemnity obligations and waivers of subrogation obligations. So just over the line between those two states, you might win the argument in one state and lose it the other. So, Gary, we have a time now for um, some questions as well as um, some of the other things that um, I think you were going to uh, to talk about. Yeah, you bet. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, you know, I, I don't know how many webinars we've given over the years, and every time I do, I, I go, oh, good, look, questions are coming in. People are paying attention. And I go, oh, wait, we must not have been clear. People have questions. Um, I, these are really great questions, uh, but before I get to the questions, let me touch on the um, and announce the winner of the trivia contest. Question again was the first true offshore over the water well not accessed by a pier was drilled in what state? And the answer is Louisiana. The first over the well, uh, over water well, uh, oil well was drilled in the Caddo Pine Island field in the northwest Louisiana by Gulf Oil. Uh, and the Ferry Lake number one was drilled in 1911. The winner is Linda Leatherwood with AmTrust. Way to go, Linda. Um, and just let Jamie know which book you'd like, and we'll get that out to you. <clears throat> so um, with regard to my um, dilemma, with regard to questions, we do have a lot of questions. We'll try to get to many of them here. Uh, Jim, one, one that I might throw right back to you Um well, here, here. Uh, Tom in Rhode Island wrote, what if a contract requires a policy to be endorsed to waive subrogation, but there is no endorsement in the policy? Uh, colon, will the insured be sued? Question mark. Will we? Question mark. I, uh, and Jim, I think, I think you addressed that. And, and obviously, you have to have the endorsement in the policy for the waiver to be effective. If you turn open the policy and there is no waiver and one is required by the contract, I think Jim mentioned, uh, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, there may be a breach of contract um, action there against the insured if that was required and it wasn't done. Um, and then will we, question mark, I guess you mean the carrier, um, I, I, I you know, I guess that gets into underwriting. If if a waiver of endorsement was requested and required by the broker or the agent and it wasn't included in the policy, I guess that raises all kinds of questions that sort of transcend what we're talking about. But is that, do, do I have that Yeah, right Gary, if I could, yeah, if I could add to that. I mean, a lot of times what happens is um, usually when that occurs, it's, it's in the insurance agent's lap. Most of the time when I see it, I, I've defended a lot of insurance agents and E&O claims over the years as well. And yeah, quite often it's a um, it, it's a mistake on the agent's part in terms of requesting the proper coverage um, and communicating. But if your insurance company uh, is one of these companies that um, is not using an independent agent, you're using a direct agent, your your state farm or your Allstate, and your coverage is placed directly through employed agents, then it's maybe back in your your lap anyway. Okay, uh, Tyler in Mississippi asks, does uh, waiver does waiver waive reimbursement rights question mark credit rights question mark question mark um and jim i don't know if you want to take that but i you know i i it's my understanding that the waiver waives our right to subrogate and unlike, correct yeah un, unlike state law and by the way i argued the case to the texas court of appeals that the buckland <clears throat> hartford v buckland case which is the case that says if you have a waiver of subrogation in texas state comp law you waive your right to re, you waive your right to sue the third party carrier sues the third party that's subrogation you waive your right, right to reimbursement under the policy uh, and under the act and you also waive your right to a future credit um, which is, is a little bit harsh considering uh, Texas is a very favorable jurisdiction for comp but in Longshore no that's not the case you waive your right to subrogation but you still have the the potential for recovery of a reimbursement in your uh, your credit because the way the act is is read. Do you agree with that, Jim? Yeah, I do. And actually that that kind of 
comes um, brings up something that I did want to mention too is, you know, a lot of times um, what we've seen with in insurance clients is when they know that a waiver of subrogation is going to apply, um, they think, well, you know, there's no reason for me to get involved in the litigation in the in the third party case that's filed in, in a federal court somewhere. Um, I just need to to wait and see what's going to happen, and then I can document my credit. The problem comes sometimes in the gerrymandering situations you talked about, Gary, is if you're Sometimes if you have a large enough credit at stake, it, it behooves you to retain counsel anyway, intervene in the case so that you can pay attention and know what's going on. Because it's very hard after the fact to come back and argue that um, a great amount of the damages should not be of a portion to the, the minor daughter's claim or to the wife's loss of consortium claim um, if you've not been involved in, in the case. And uh, you, it's really good to, to have somebody there to know um, and be involved in the case um, so that they can argue um, that they've gerrymandered, you know, the settlement to reduce the credit. Hey, Gary, can I take this next question from uh, Stephen yeah. from London? Go ahead. Um, Stephen from London says, uh, what happens if the employer voluntarily accepts defense indemnification, even though the Oilfield Indemnity Act would have invalidated it? Um, that's that's a, a really good question. Uh, you know, under that scenario, you'd expect the court at least in Louisiana and in the Fifth Circuit, to say that since there is indemnity, then the Louisiana Oil Field Indemnity Act applies um, to invalidate the waiver because the, the act has not been frustrated. But there's, there was a case just recently, just came out on March 20th of this year, that had that exact same scenario, and the court somehow found a way to say, no, um, that we are not going to allow um, the... Uh, Outed. We're going to enforce the waiver of subrogation, even though the employer accepted defense <clears throat> indemnity. And the employer is sitting here arguing, wait a minute, I've accepted defense indemnity, and I've paid all these longshore benefits, and I can't subrogate. I'm paying twice. How is that fair? And what the, the court said, it's the Western District of Louisiana. The case is called Castile versus Apache Deepwater LLC. It's 2018 Westlaw 141. 5695 that's 2018 WL 1415695 and what the court the court accepted the argument of the of the plaintiff attorney and uh, the defendant oil company that said that when the employer accepted the contractual defense indemnity claim they waived the Louisiana oil field acts protections you know it was a business decision this employer wanted to keep the business of this large oil company and so decided even though they didn't have to because the oil field indemnity act was going to invalidate indemnity even though they didn't have to they accepted indemnity the court said well since you did that you waived the louisiana oil field act protection and you waived the right to argue that the louisiana oil field act applies to the waiver of subrogation to invalidate the waiver of subrogation so they sort of went around the intent of the act there and and stuck the employer and stuck the longshore carrier anyway. I'm hoping that one is going to be appealed. We're not involved in that one. If, if we were, we would definitely be appealing it. Um, but it would be interesting to see what happens with that case going forward. You know, I, I've got to throw this out there. Uh, Jim, you, you mentioned um, Louisiana being very highly litigated with the Anti-Indemnity Act and because of its long coastline. And you know, immediately I'm going, well, wait a second, Jim. I mean, it's not that long. You've got Texas. You've got you know, Mississippi and, and Alabama. But this probably should have been our trivia question. Which state has the longest coastline? All right, well, you know, some of us can, can go, well, okay, Alaska. And yeah, Alaska is right, 33,000 miles of continuous coastline. Number two is Florida at 8,400 miles. Get this, number three, Louisiana, 7,700. It's just a fraction less than Florida. And and some of you are going, wait, wait, what about Hawaii with all the islands? Only a thousand miles of coastline for Hawaii. I, anyway, I thought I'd throw that out there because I love that stuff. Um, I've got a question here from Tyler in Mississippi. Does does a waiver of subrogation, <clears throat> oh, wait a second, I read that one. Kathy in San Francisco, longshore subrogation against medical malpractice question mark. Um, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and that, that's a good question. I, I actually I feel negligent to not having mentioned it. Um, uh, and, and this is one of the few areas where we, Longshore is better than state comp almost ex across the board. Um, a lot of states do not allow medical malpractice to be subrogated. 
um, uh, Longshore does, provided that the uh, malpractice committed uh, actually aggravates the injury and exacerbates the injury. I've got several Longshore cases going on right now where we've got doctors looking at medical records and saying, yeah, he nicked the, the esophagus or the, the dural ner nerve sac, and therefore all of the millions of medical that you, you're paying out here were caused by this doctor, not by the slip and fall on the gangplank. Um, so the answer is yes. But what's interesting is, Robert, in Orange, California, or just down the coastline, um, and by the way, California was not listed on that list in the top four. Interesting. Uh, Robert in Orange, California says, does legal malpractice qualify as a third party in Longshore? And this is one of the areas where Longshore is actually one of the few areas where it's actually not as good as state comp because many state states allow us to subrogate in legal malpractice, providing we can show causation. Uh, Longshore does not. So the answer is a resounding no on that. <clears throat> um, Jay in Houston, and there's two related questions. Jay in Houston asks, um, what things have to happen in order for the employee to be denied benefits for settling a third party claim without the carrier's permission? And then uh, at the same time, um, Eric, uh, I don't have a state, Eric with Gallagher Bassett says, recommend mentioning forfeiture clause in 33G. So the, the answer, Jay, is that in order for the 33G bar to take place, three things have to happen. Number one, you have to be someone considered a person entitled to compensation. Number two, you have to settle a third party action without prior permission of the employer. Under, uh, on, uh, and there, then again, we saw the form LS33. And number three, the third requirement is that the settlement must be for less than the total compensation which is owed to the person entitled under the Longshore Act. So if you have, if you have that um, perfect storm, um, then you are entitled to uh, forfeiture of benefits. The employee forfeits, forfeits benefits, um, and um, so that I think that answers that. Uh, we've got one minute left. <clears throat> um, Renee in Long Beach: If a vessel owner is sued as a third party, does the cop carrier have a right of subrogation or reimbursement against the third party action filed by the employee against the vessel owner? Question mark. I guess I'm asking. What if the longshore person, <laughs> she has a smiley face, uh, makes a comment about gender, oh no, make comment about gender neutrality. Uh, what if the longshore person later turns out to be a seaman or crew member of a vessel? Okay, that is a really good question, and I enjoy the smiley face. Uh, vessel owners are typical third parties. They're entities other than the employer. However, vessel owners may also be the owners of the stevedoring companies, as I mentioned. If that's the case, a third party defendant has a dual capacity. Number one, they're the employer of the longshoreman. Number two, they're the vessel owner. Therefore, because of this dual capacity, they're wearing two hats, a carrier can intervene into a third party suit to recover its lien against its own insured under those circumstances. And there was a case just a couple of years ago uh, out of the Fifth Circuit, uh, Shenevert versus Travelers, which involved facts very, very similar in which the employee uh, received a whole bunch of, of longshore benefits, hundreds of thousands, and the insurer, in that case travelers, stopped the benefits because the employee filed a Jones Act against his employer and then suddenly claimed he was a seaman rather than a longshoreman. So when it became clear in discussions to settle the Jones Act lawsuit um, that uh, the employee opposed any effort by travelers to recover its payments, um, the Fifth Circuit had to decide whether an insurer's subrogation rights against a 905B, that's against the vessel recovery, also existed as to a Jones Act recovery. And the court said that the rule prohibiting a carrier from subrogate, subrogating against its own insured, um, they said it was valid when the claims arise from the, only when they arise from the very risk for which the insured was covered by the insurer. That's a long way of saying travelers did not insure the employer against Jones Act liability, and therefore, as a result, an insurer who makes voluntary longshore payments to an injured employee on behalf of the employer acquires a subrogation lien on any recovery by the employee in a Jones Act suit against the employer based on the injuries for which the insurer has already compensated him. Uh, that's a long answer to a, a tough but very good question. And I see that we have a, a number of other questions which we don't have time to do, but Jim and I promise uh, 